Great to be here on Wurundjeri country. Um, yeah, so I, I live currently on Darawal country and um, it, it's, not to, it's not where I spent most of my life. And I, I didn't have a great interest in moving to Wollongong there. I could only think of um, smokestacks and industrial areas. And I've got a view down over Mordor, uh, um, Port Kembla. And, uh, but the country behind me is um, just these little remnants hiding amongst the escarpment, these, these vestiges of Darawal country, and it's coming back. And you still see the birds living there as if, as if Wollongong doesn't exist. You still see these lives continuing on. And that connection with country, I find now, after, after um, about a decade there, I'll be grieving leaving that country one day, just as much as I found it hard to leave Ngaragu country where I was before in the snowies. Um, so if it's that hard for me, then I, I, I think for, for people who've lived for, you know, tens of thousands of years of tradition on country, I, I can only imagine. But um, in my area on Darawal country, um, there's a tradition that's shared up and down parts of the coast there where there's um, talk about uh, one of the creator spirits, um, Durham Mullen. And, um, and I'll, I'll just sort of cover this as a, as, a, as a general idea because I'm no expert in this, but I, I found that this concept, Uncle Rod Mason, uh, who's a, a Ngaragu elder um, who taught me a lot years ago, um, Uncle Rod impressed on me this concept of something he called Bagal kinship. And Dara Mullen was a, was a creator spirit who was so central in um, instilling kinship to people. In, in spring, nations would gather from around uh, quite a, a large radius and would gather up at uh, Mount Yango, up in uh, Duganyong country, sort of northwest of Sydney and uh, would, would meet there together. And, and the young people who were coming of age would go out into the forest by themselves and meet Durramullen. And Durramullen would give them kinship with a plant or a, an animal, some species in the landscape there. And what kinship meant was that you now spoke on behalf of that species and it, it defined the way you related to other species and other people and across nations. And so you had these, these lines that tied you across country, across cultural boundaries, across species. This concept of kinship was like a, a net over the landscape and over the biosphere that tied everything together. And so in spring, one of the traditions of Durramullen was that he lived in the trees. And when you heard wind in the trees, you heard the voice of Durramullen. So as the gales would come through in spring and it was time to go to Yango and meet together, you'd hear these gales roaring up the valley. And it's the voice of Durramullen coming to you and reminding you it's time to come and remember kinship. And kinship was this message that was seen as so central to how you live life and how you live in this landscape. It's, it's the survival tool, the way that Uncle Rod put it across to me. Now, a few years ago now, this happened and we, we had one of the agricultural revolutions that have occurred in the world. And what happened was that people learnt that you could do things like um, chain up oxen and get them to do the work for you. And you could, instead of walking out to find other plants, you could get them growing all around you and, and, and structure the landscape so that um, the food was near you and you could, you could prosper in that way. And it was a totally different way of looking at the world. Instead of 
being part of the landscape, instead of being one of the species, instead of belonging to country, you are now a step above people. You are something separate. And from that, we, we, a lot of this, this thinking was encoded in religion, which shaped society and, and spread out into the Western world, where we had this focus on our species filling the earth, subduing the other species, having dominion over other species, an entirely opposite thinking to kinship something fundamentally opposite. How did this influence Australia when these two ways of thinking converged? Uh, and we can look at this from a fire perspective. Uh, the, the longest term perspectives we can get are by looking at charcoal residues. And this is a, um, a, a sort of a combination of charcoal measures made across the country We've got it going back about 40,000 years, but um, you know, First Nations were here a long time before that. And what we see is, is fluctuations, um, you know, climatic variation in there. Um, there's probably a lot of stories in there that, um, that we don't know the answers to at this point. Um, but that's, that's nearly 40,000 years worth of history. Now, at the, the right-hand end of this, something happened and we had people that came from this place. This is a, a British moor. Um, reminds me a little bit of the Monero grasslands where I lived for a long time. The difference is that Monero grasslands were a natural formation. The British moors used to be forest. And the reason they're not forest anymore is because of these people um, who uh, burnt the forest and then they burned the heather. And if you don't burn, that anymore. Trees start coming back. The forest starts trying to return. This is called a disclimax state. You're constantly disturbing it to try and keep it into the state that you want. If you burn the heather, you attract grouse to the young heather. And if you have grouse, you attract rich people with guns. And so you, you, you maintain your open grazing lands in this way. You've, you've got um, animals that you want that are productive to your way of, of choosing to live your life. And so graziers from this area came to Australia and they brought this way of thinking that this is how you clear forests, this is how you create open country. They were working from this mindset of dominion, of subdue the earth. We, we, we have forests here, but we don't want the forests. We want an open country here so, so that we can have this species of, of animal here to to graze and, and to live with. And, um, and when they came, this happened. It's, it's the hockey stick of fire. Now there's debate as to what happened here, why there was this sudden increase in charcoal. On the surface of things, it looks quite obvious that the people who were doing that burning brought that fire to Australia and now we had this huge increase. But this is, there's a different interpretation that has been brought in by people because we, we interpret things through a lens that, um, that makes sense to us. And our lens, for most of us in this room, not everybody, but for most of us, we are influenced by a lens of subdue the earth. We have the colonizers thinking. We have thinking that, uh, that unless we take hold of things and take charge that they will get out of control and from a colonizer's perspective that looks like something that has gotten out of our control and this was uh, sort of encapsulated in this concept of fuel loads and biomass that the risk we're told is that um, we're getting these huge fires because we have too much biomass. So think about the word biomass, bio life, the weight of life, the weight of all lives. Generally, we don't include ourselves in that. We're talking about the weight of all life that's not us. It's not us, it's them. 
So the weight of biomass is the weight of all of the other lives that we could have had kinship with, but now we try to have dominion over. So the problem we're told is that there's too much other life. Things are out of balance. The forests are not disturbed enough. We need more disturbed forests. So we say that the solution to too much biomass is reduce the mass of other lives. So we burn it away, we log it away, we thin it, and we try to exert our dominion back onto that forested landscape. And that, we are told, in our culture, in our way of thinking, is the way to, to reduce that charcoal peak, bring that fire back down. Where did this thinking come from? This is in North Carolina. Um, it's, a, it's a plantation of longleaf pine. And the issue in this area, longleaf pine is a timber species. Um, if you don't burn this country very, very frequently, succession happens. It's a disclimax community like the heathlands. If you, if you don't burn it, you start getting oak trees and hickory trees and other long-lived trees that, that come in as part of succession. And what they do is they create a moist environment that suppresses fire. And so the story um, from the Texas Journal Garden and Gun was that um, this man came into the area and he, he bought up an area of, of, of oak forest and he wanted longleaf pine and he tried to burn it and he couldn't burn it because it's almost impossible to burn that country there. They call it mesification. Um, and so he had to poison the whole lot and plant out the longleaf pine. So managing longleaf pine has for a long time been something that has needed fire use. And during the 1950s, George Byram, an American scientist, um, developed a model that, that looked at um, how fire behaves in, in these sorts of environments. And, and he looked at it based on weather conditions, but also based on the weight of leaf litter on the ground, which he called the fuel load. This is where we get the language of fuel coming into our thinking. Um, that idea of fuel load was very quickly brought into Australia. And, um, and so we, we started trying to apply it to this. But as you can see already, we've got a more complex forested landscape. Now, Byram came up with this idea that um, it, you can calculate the intensity of a fire because a certain fuel contains a certain number of, um, of kilojoules of energy. And if you burn it at a certain rate, then you're releasing a certain number of kilowatts of energy. And that's, that's Byram's intensity model. So effectively, it's just the, the rate that the fire is spreading and the weight of fuel. You multiply those two together. Um, now, this particular site here is in WA. It's an area that I studied because in the, the hollow in the tree up the top, um, this hollow is home to a western ringtail possum, this guy. And, um, and a prescribed burn being conducted in this area was, uh, was intended to be very low intensity. So we use the equation rate of spread times fuel load it gives you intensity. So if you've got a large fuel load like a, like a grass tree, like, um, like this bulgar, then the way to get low intensity fire is to burn it, <coughs> burn it very slowly. And in that case, that's what a, a burning bulgar looks like. And because you're only just burning that individual plant, you've got a rate of spread of zero. So zero times fuel load means your intensity is zero. So there's a zero intensity fire burning underneath that hollow. Um, now, I used my fire modelling to look at the temperatures over time up in the hollow there. And you can see the dotted line gives you the air temperature, but each successive line is a, is a penetration down through the wood. And the red line there is the temperature inside the hollow. And because that red line crossed the horizontal line there, we crossed into a point where it meant that that um, wire, the ringtail possum, um, got, uh, he, he asphyxiated due to his airways burning. And, um, and 
sorry, fair warning here, but um, here's the fella tried to escape. 77% um, of the ringtail population were killed in this way, in this very small urban patch by a zero intensity fire. So we have, we have some very, very bad fire science that, that massively oversimplifies this, this world because we've tried to tie things back into a concept of fuel load, that the amount of biomass is the risk to us. Another part of this was uh, when MacArthur tied it to rate of spread, and yet we can see that's been tested multiple times over and we can see that rate of spread is not what it, it, it isn't driven by fuel load. It, it's a disproved concept. So, how do we maintain this idea if a lot of this has been disproved now over the, over the previous decades? Why do we still hold on to this? And part of it is the way that we do our research on this and the time periods that we look at. And just to give you a, a hypothetical example, imagine there's a, a drug that someone has developed and, um, and what happens is that people who uh, have high anxiety and, uh, you know, and become very agitated, if they take this drug, they become calm. And yet the longer they go without this drug, the more that anxiety returns. And so if you did a study just on that, you would say, yes, keep taking the drug and take them from there down to there. But if you were to look at it over a longer time period and saw that trend happening, that people who had never taken the drug or who'd not had it for a really long time were actually calm all the time and didn't need to keep taking it, you've changed it from a cure to the cause. And this is what we've seen when we looked at fire risk across a landscape with time since fire, time since logging, time since thinning, we see these curves popping up right across, regardless of the forest types that we're looking at through Victoria and the Alps. We're seeing these trends. These are from the, the Black Summer. Um, uh, during the, the most ex extreme sort of part of the, the, the fire spread that year. Um, you know, again, we've seen this one here with, with post logging effects. Why does this happen? Why is there this increase in flammability following fire? And it's because going back to basic principles, I'm going to use, use my model to sort of explain this here. We know that if you've got some fuel, you'll get some fire. If you have more fuel, like shrubs, you'll get more fire. And again, as those shrubs get larger, you get larger flames. That all seems to make sense. But you'll notice that some of these plants aren't burning. And across the black summer, you only had crown fires for about 11% uh, of the time, I think. The rest of the time, um, those taller plants weren't burning. And while they're not burning, they're slowing the wind speed beneath them. So they're slowing the fire down. Now there's a, a basic principle that Ray Specht um, developed some decades ago that, that it, it makes a lot of sense. You, you take out taller plants and smaller plants will grow from the ground. You take out these plants that are slowing the wind, the overstory shelter, and they will regrow from the ground as fuel. If you scorch them by burning them, if you cut them down to thin them or log the forest, they will regrow again from the ground and they'll be down here where it can be fuel. If you leave them alone for long enough, then that fuel develops into overstory shelter. You now have the most biomass. Biomass is no longer the threat. The most biomass gives you the lowest fire risk because it's up tallest. Now this varies between forests. In, in say mountain ash forests, we still maintain a very mesic understory now that we've got plants there that can <coughs> cope with shade and don't burn well. But this is what we call ecological control theory. It's the way that forests naturally managed fire since Gondwana before we turned up and cut them down to save them. So just to, just to finish, Uncle Rod used to tell me about um, a way they used fire in this landscape here where um, they'd come up in the spring, they'd camp 
at uh, this site at the base of Yulagumbra Mountain. Yulagumbra was the rainmaker. And as people who had Bagao kinship with the Matruk Wattle watched the flowers fall, they'd say, it's time for us to leave this site. Um, time for us to move on. And so the rain men would watch for the morning or the day that Dilligumbra got cloud on his head. And as he got the cloud on his head, they'd walk up to the top of the hill and, um, and they'd say, Buduri Dilligumbra, and throw out a fire stick and thank Dilligumbra for his country. And then they'd walk away. And the following autumn, they'd come back with, with fruits from the mountains up in Tidbilliga and come back across the grassland with these fruits and they'd eat these fruits down at the campsite. But these fruits were also growing around the camp and they were maintained through these small focused burns, not landscape burns, but small focused burns where you took your place as one part of that landscape, not as the dominant species that controlled it. And that, that depth of language is something that we need to, we need to start respecting again and understanding that this knowledge is complex. So thanks very much. <laughs>